Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> it is needless to say that what's happening in the European <laughs> Union matters to all of us. Economically speaking, the European Union is the largest economic region in the world, only neck and neck with that of the United States of America. But this uh, European Union is now facing challenges both from within and without the Brexit and the President Donald Trump's policy towards the European Union and the rest of the world. So this morning we have a very special guest speaker who will enlighten us on all these issues and particularly those serious challenges facing the uh, European Union today. Uh, before I invite uh, today's speaker to the podium, uh, I would like to introduce the our new ambassador from European Union, who is with us here this morning, and I will ask him to introduce today's uh, guest speaker. The, um, our ambassador is Mihail Reiter, uh, who arrived in uh, Seoul not long ago. He served uh, his by nationality, he is Austrian, but he worked for Austrian government in his government's uh, foreign service. Then he has been working for various uh, branches of European Union, uh, the uh, uh, governments and uh, agencies. He served uh, ambassador to Switzerland and other uh, uh, countries as well, and he spent substantial period of time in Tokyo uh, as um, head of um, the deputy head of European Commission uh, there. And also, I just gathered that he worked for worked in Tokyo as uh, Austrian uh, diplomat. Uh, Ambassador Reiter is a scholar as well. He has degree in uh, doctorate degree in law and he's agent professor uh, of international politics at the University of Inns the uh, uh, Innsbruck. Now, uh, with this, uh, with no further ado, I would like to invite the Ambassador to introduce uh, today's uh, special speaker. Mr. Ambassador. Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you very much for coming that early. I think it's always, always brave, uh, but I think it's the convening power of our host who, who, who made you all come and of course uh, the speaker. I'm, I'm privileged uh, to introduce uh, Thomas Visa, who has come for the first time in his function to Korea and I think that's, that's a, a, very, a, very good, a very good sign. I think we are responding also to a call of President Moon, who has sent for the first time a special envoy after his selection, not only to the neighboring countries, but also to the European institutions and to Germany. So we want to take up that ball. And one of the important 
features of the European Union is the euro, our common currency. Not all member states do have the euro, but ever since it was introduced, it became very quickly the second largest and most important reserve currency in the world. Now, the euro needs management. So we have a euro group of finance ministers, but all of us who have worked as officials, we know you cannot, leave, you cannot let ministers do the job alone. You have to prepare. You have to prepare them, and you have to prepare for them. And this is exactly what Thomas Wieser is doing, working to prepare the important meetings of the ministers of finance of the Eurogroup. That has become an institution now in Brussels, and it is a rather outstanding position, uh, just to remind you that one of his pre predecessor is Mr. Draghi, who happens to be today the president of the European Central Bank. I'm also privileged because I know Thomas Wieser already for many, many years. We are both from Austria, and we went to high school together. <laughs> Don't laugh. <laughs> Um, Just 10 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but before he, be, before he came to Innsbruck, he already had an international career as a, as a child, because he, he was actually born in Bethesda, which seems to be somewhere in the United States. Uh, but he has, he has managed to overcome this little problem <laughs> and become a very distinguished Austrian official who was working a lot of time in the Ministry of Finance. He was Director General at the Ministry of Finance, and that's one of the top positions in the, in, in the Austrian system. He has worked in the, for the European Free Trade uh, Association in Geneva, where we were also again for some time in parallel. And when he was, I think, called to, to serve in Brussels, he was called there because of his long-standing experience in, in, uh, in economics, macroeconomics, and financial matters. He's also giving speeches, he's writing, and he has so not only the operational, but also the intellectual work to do in order to be prepared. So I think he will wake you up in case that you are still asleep. Uh, he has already given a speech also yesterday at, the, at, at Korea University. He had meetings at the, at the Bank of Korea. He had meetings with the Ministry of Finance. And now, just before we transport him back to the airport, 48 hours in, in Seoul. Uh, I think you are privileged to hear his ideas, and I think it's a really good special lecture. And Thomas, thank you for taking the time, the effort to come and to address us this morning. And Mr. Il Sakong, thank you very much for hosting us. I think it's a privilege, and I'm looking forward to the lecture. Thank you very much. So, ladies and gentlemen, thanks. Thank you very much uh, for uh, joining us after these uh, many kind words uh, of introduction. And what I was invited to talk about was uh, about the global challenges for the European Union, uh, and we called it between Trump and Brexit. Uh, you could also say between a rock and a hard place, uh, and. Uh, obviously, uh, these are issues uh, which five years ago uh, nobody would have talked about. So we're in very new uh, circumstances. And what I will attempt to do is try and explain sort of 
the political challenges and the economic challenges and how uh, I see uh, possible uh, solutions. And as, as one says, we live in very exciting times, which is sometimes a challenge and sometimes a threat. Uh, and what one can definitely say, which is being repeated again and again, is that these are times of political uncertainty. And these are times of the highest degree of unpredictability, probably, uh, that we have seen uh, since the fall of the uh, Iron Curtain. And economics and politics, they go hand in hand together. The one without the other uh, is unimaginable. And many of the shifts and many of the attitudes that we are seeing today uh, have been driven also by quite tectonic shifts in comparative advantage, which are also known as uh, globalization. Many of these attitudes and shifts have also been driven by enormous technological uh, change. And all of this against the background, in, especially in uh, industrialized economies, of low growth, low productivity growth, and of course, the aftermath of the financial crisis 2008 uh, following. And the rock and the hard place in the title, Mr. Trump uh, and Brexit, they are, to my mind, just two very, very similar uh, symbolic expressions of popular discontent. Uh, and this popular discontent is very closely connected to the reasons I mentioned. Uh, they are intimately connected to the effects of globalization on employment, the effects of globalization on environment, financial stability, issues of migration, uh, security and public order. And this is therefore an era which probably more than ever before, uh, where, is where we are confronted with global challenges, but we have national policies to combat global challenges. And that is uh, the somewhat uh, heterodox uh, situation. And we have all grown up, some of us are younger, some of us are older, but everybody in this room has grown up with a strong belief in and a strong background of strong multilateral institutions, which through a web of international agreements and common understandings, worked towards producing global public goods and in combating global uh, public bads. And the big question that we're facing today between the rock and the hard places, is there in a way a certain retreat from this understanding, which would be very unorthodox, which would be counterproductive because the problems are more global and some would seem to want more national solutions. And this can't work out. So of all of these challenges that I mentioned, of globalization and technology and migration and uh, security and public order and financial stability, all of these issues uh, are impacting uh, tremendously also on Europe, uh, obviously, and not only in its external manifestation, but also uh, internally. And the European Union is, in a way, of course, a uh, supranational uh, entity, and that helps us, 28 still, 28 member states, to bring a higher impact to the global stage than most of us could do individually. And if you talk about the European Union and its member states outside of the European Union, most people think of Angela Merkel and uh, uh, now Emmanuel Macron, but very few people think of the small, smaller member states like Portugal or Sweden, Finland, Austria, Belgium, Holland, who all by themselves uh, would be affected by these global challenges and have no voice in the, in, on the global uh, scale. So if we want to have an impact on these issues as a European Union, we need to find a common language and we need to find a common approach 
uh, to these issues. And this explains also, uh, in a way, uh, some of the problems of popular discontent that many, many are facing, not only in the United States, not only in the United Kingdom, but in many countries uh, of uh, the industrialized world and also in emerging markets. And for somebody, take, take as, as an example, somebody who has lost out to globalization or technological change in France. This person does not ask if it was uh, if he or she lost out to competition from Poland or competition from China, uh, what this person says is France, my politicians in France and the European Union, they have not managed to save my job. And they do not accuse somebody uh, in China of uh, having, through competition, uh, made him or her lose the job. It's the French politician and it's the European Union uh, that have uh, not managed uh, to do uh, what, they, what they should be doing. And this poses, of course, uh, significant challenges for uh, the legitimacy or the accountability uh, of the European Union, which go beyond legitimacy questions uh, of single member states. Of course, we also have uh, the issue that different people and different member states have different views of how the European Union uh, should contribute to solving these issues. I have been engaged uh, in discussions between, uh, for example, Danish and Polish uh, colleagues trying to come to grips with the financing uh, of climate change actions. They have very, very different views which are colored by their national heritage. In Poland, uh, you have very many uh, uh, from the old era still uh, coal industries, whereas Denmark uh, is a global leader in uh, wind energy, renewable energies. How did they come to grips with each other? But we have the institutions where you talk to each other, where you work with each other, and somehow thrash out uh, a uh, solution. But it's more difficult than in a fairly homogeneous nation state. So Brexit and Mr. Trump, they are both manifestations of pressures, as I said, that we're all feeling. Uh, it is uh, a time of discontent because of we are in a time of dislocation. Uh, and this will not be over uh, very, very rapidly. And this means, of course, uh, that these manifestations can be a risk where then you retreat onto yourself and say the world is getting very complicated, uh, we'll do it uh, by uh, hunkering down and uh, uh, not trying to ignore the issue, or you see it as a great chance. Uh, and the great chance is of course uh, to deepen uh, cooperation within the European Union and to deepen uh, international uh, partnerships. So this raises the issue then to me internally, uh, what can we do in order to internally stabilize uh, ourselves? And that is mostly what uh, uh, I've been invited uh, to talk about. And we have thought extensively, written extensively uh, on these issues and try to draw the lessons uh, from the crisis 2008 and following, which was a much more demanding crisis, uh, a much more potentially destabilizing crisis uh, than other industrialized uh, 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 economies went through in the aftermath of the 2008 Lehman Brothers uh, crash. Uh, one of the issues uh, which is a perennial uh, issue in the European Union is the confrontation by the people that say you are lacking democratic accountability, you are lacking democratic legitimacy, which is very astonishing because there's a huge European Parliament. There are so many parliamentarians in there. You should, well, many of you know the buildings. Uh, but 
having a European Parliament, which even is directly elected, led to a loss of legitimacy of national parliaments. National parliaments are to a lower degree than ever before seized with European Union business. We have to bring European Union business back to the people, back to national parliaments. We have a system which is legitimized through, uh, uh, through votes, uh, through participation, and you could say it is in the way political scientists talk about it, input legitimacy. But what comes out of the political process is not owned by the people, and therefore we need to move towards more output or outcome uh, legitimacy. Second issue uh, which we have to work on is inclusive growth. As I said, globalization, international trade, technological advance, very beneficial overall to mankind. Very beneficial not only to industrialized economies, but to emerging markets. But it has its disruptive effects. And when we were back in university and were learning economics, uh, approximately in the third or fourth lesson, some professor turned up and told us that free trade is optimal for welfare. And then if it was a good professor, he said, comma, if the winners compensate the losers. And over the last 20 years, since the invention of MS Word, Microsoft Word, somebody has highlighted if the winners compensate the losers and press the delete button. So we have been surrounded by people who say free trade is optimal, full stop. And free trade was good on aggregate for Austria, free trade was good on aggregate for Japan, for Korea, for the Netherlands, and possibly also for Burundi. But we have produced more and more people who have been left behind. So the distributional impact of how the world has grown together, the distributional impact has produced the votes for Brexit. And it has produced the votes for Mr. Trump. And it has produced popular discontent in many, many of the industrialized economies, which I know better uh, than the countries outside Europe. And we've been lucky so far. We've got a new French president who is the exact opposite of this populism. And we have had electoral results in the Netherlands which have been the exact opposite uh, of this populism. But because you win a few, it doesn't mean that it's gone away. It's like winning the first two soccer matches or the third and the fourth soccer match uh, in a uh, long tournament but you ain't there until you've won the world championship or whatever uh, you're talking about. So if we want to produce a higher degree of output legitimacy, if we want to rejuvenate, believe in democracy and elected governments, and therefore also in the European Union, we have to do something about making growth uh, more inclusive. But the question then is, of course, third point. Where does all of this come from, the growth that you can distribute? So competitiveness uh, will uh, need to be something uh, that we need to work on uh, more intensively in some member states more than in others. We have experienced over the crisis imbalances between, for example, Germany and Italy significant current account deficits within a monetary union and that has been contributing to the sometimes destabilizing uh, experiences we have had after 2008. And that stems also from the fact because monetary union is not a political union. There is a difference between the relationship between Italy and Germany compared to the relationship between Mississippi and Massachusetts. In Mississippi, a current account deficit with Massachusetts, it's not even that it doesn't matter. Hardly anybody knows what it would be like. Whereas in between Germany and Italy, everybody's cognizant of the matter, and it matters. And that is why 
uh, we need uh, to work not only towards making growth more inclusive, uh, but increasing productivity, especially uh, in some of the uh, member states. We have to make labor as a factor of production uh, more attractive. And much of this is connected and interconnected with what individual member states need to do. So it's not uh, as, uh, uh, maybe in paraphrasing John F. Kennedy, don't wa ask what the European Union can do for you, but ask what you can do for the European Union. And uh, that means uh, increasing uh, the quality uh, of policy making, economic policy making, in some of the more uh, uh, unpro more productivity lagging member states. And all of this together, fourth point, uh, works well uh, if there is a high degree of uh, financial uh, resilience, financial stability. And we've grown up, and I made reference to this at the outset, we've grown up uh, accustomed to a multilateral web of institutions and processes where we work together the Austrians and the Americans, uh, Korea and the Netherlands, uh, Japan uh, and uh, Germany, on elaborating rules of how international finance works. And most of this is done in the context uh, of the Financial Stability Board nowadays, Bank for International Settlements in Basel. And we have had the gentleman's, gentlewoman's agreement that we then go home and we implement what we decided in Basel, more or less identically, and that is how and why a Korean bank can do business in Australia, in the United Kingdom, German banks in the United States, American banks in, etc. And it has only worked because everybody, maybe not quite everybody, but every, nearly everybody participated in this and we believed in it, and now all of a sudden there is a danger. And we read letters from the head uh, uh, of the Financial Service Committee of US Congress to Janet Yellen, uh, talking about uh, how impossible it is uh, for bureaucrats to lead negotiations in foreign lands on matters which have not been publicly decided by politicians. Uh, we increasingly see signs of retreat from multilateral institutions. And if there is retreat by one major country from multilateral institutions, it is a bit uh, like my mother used to teach me, if you have a sweater and things start to go and you start pulling the wool, then all of a sudden there is no sweater any longer and you're just holding uh, 17 meters of wool in your hand. <laughs> Nothing left. And you're naked. <laughs> if you've got forgotten to have a t-shirt on. And the same would happen with multilateral institutions. So that is uh, why, I, uh, why I am uh, actually uh, also coming to Korea to see, discuss attitudes towards multilateralism, see what it is uh, if there is a danger of partial retreat from such uh, global multilateralism. And what we have been trying to do together with all our global international partners uh, is make progress on having more resilient financial institutions in bringing to an end the principle of large banking of too big uh, to fail. Uh, we have over the last seven years, uh, eight years, I think have been very successful in making these uh, uh, toxic derivatives uh, and derivatives market more safe. And we have been fairly successful uh, in transforming the so-called shadow banking sector uh, into a more resilient market-based uh, financing uh, instrument. But, and that for me is the key, uh, what happens if one partner uh, withdraws? What happens then uh, to your country uh, and how it is interlinked into the global system of banking rules? How, what happens to the European Union? And this is also a parallel what happens when Brexit occurs. 
Will banks, will a Korean bank that is located in London right now be able to do business with German firms, French firms, Dutch firms as it was doing before? It is possible, but not very likely, because it would need to follow the identical, not the same, but the identical rules that regulate the conduct of business in Germany, in France, and in Holland. It would need to be supervised to the exactly same, in, the, in exactly the same manner as the German and the French and the Dutch and the Belgian banks, for example. And in case judicial doubt ever arises, there would need to be judicial oversight, which at present is exerted by the European Court of Justice. And it is very difficult to imagine a state of the European world where one country leaves the European Union completely, but nevertheless we have the same business environment as before. There is a difference between membership and non-membership. There is no evading that. So we are faced with challenges from globalization. We have been faced with challenges of some countries attempted retreat from multilateralism. I'm being polite. And uh, the same forces that shaped this unmentioned, unmentionable things has also been facing uh, us uh, to the extent that it makes people question why they are uh, part of this. So uh, these are the big challenges we're facing uh, right now. Others to include uh, demographic change, of course, the considerable aging of European societies, notwithstanding a uh, significant uh, uh, impact of migration uh, which we're experiencing right now, and which also has led to political problems. Because as the homogeneity of societies is put into question, the allegiance of the people to the politicians and those who run the society uh, sometimes gets a bit more tenuous. Other challenges, happy to answer some questions uh, in the discussion, and you made already allusion to it uh, in, a, in a way, uh, is the incipient monetary policy tapering, uh, which will be uh, forthcoming not only in the European Union, but amongst major uh, central banks of the world. We have uh, issues uh, where uh, we need to get better in the conduct of fiscal policies, which have the twin objectives of stabilization of the economy on the one hand, but fiscal sustainability on the other. And it's very difficult to talk about fiscal sustainability in Korea with a very, very low uh, debt to GDP ratio, very low. But we've got member states with a debt to GDP ratio of 130% and beyond, and a tension within the euro area, tension within the euro area where some member states are perceived to have adequate fiscal space and others absolutely no fiscal space. And the perception is that those who have the fiscal space don't want to use it, but those that don't have the fiscal space are using it. I'm just saying that this is a perception. I'm not, I'm, I'm trying to be careful. Uh, so on, on this, uh, we are working towards uh, making uh, the euro area more efficient without uh, any uh, perspective, of course, over the next five years or 10 years of moving towards a full fiscal union where somebody at the center would be running the fiscal policies uh, of uh, those outside uh, or in the member states, to put it that way. And lastly, security and climate change are things uh, which are a challenge, but they are, of course, an impetus to do more together. And maybe to come uh, to a closure for now before we start uh, the discussion, all of these issues show uh, that there, and the development of the last 60 years show, there is no alternative 
on the continent of Europe to the European Union. And it was with great, great foresight that the European Economic Community uh, was founded. And it was a peace project, which brought peace to a continent uh, which had been divided by multiple wars, not only over the de previous decades, but over the previous centuries. And you might even say millennia. And it has brought peace. But the challenges have changed. Challenges that used to be purely domestic have become global challenges, continental challenges and then global challenges. And how do you deal with a global challenge uh, in a... How would you deal with global challenges on a continent which has 35, 40 different, sometimes very small uh, states? It doesn't work. Global challenges need global solutions. If you want to work for global solutions, you've got to have a large voice. If you want to have a large voice, do it together. And that is what we're trying to do. And that is why I think, and the title of my talk said something between Trump and Brexit. That is why I think this is, of course, a risk for all of us, these populist changes in attitudes towards governments uh, and uh, uh, multilateral institutions, but it is a chance. It is a chance if we realize that doing more together makes all of us stronger and not weaker. And with this is one of the reasons why I came uh, to uh, Korea to see about how multilateralism is perceived by one of the major players uh, uh, in, in this part of the world. And I think we have more in common than many people in our population uh, uh, would, would realize. We have profited from multilateral institutions. We have profited from the security that it provides. And we are jointly at risk if this disappears. And with that, I hope that the chances win and the risks disappear. Many thanks. Thank you very much for a very <clears throat> insightful and interesting uh, presentation on the European issues and the global implications. Uh, with this, why don't I invite comments or questions from the floor? Uh, any, any comments on the presentation or uh, related uh, issues. <coughs> Thank you uh, for your speech this morning. This point was a very um, simple question. Um, in the uh, in Europe, you have the uh, European um, Central Bank and uh, the Central Bank Governor, but you don't have a EU Finance Minister. And there has been a discussion that there is a need uh, to appoint an uh, EU finance minister who will be responsible for the Eurozone's finances. Um, and uh, recently, President Macron uh, revived this idea of appointing um, a Euro finance minister, which is now, uh, uh, if I'm not mistaken, mistaken, it was now uh, been backed by um, Chancellor Merkel, who initially was uh, lukewarm. About this idea. Do you think, how, how much do you think it will, uh, how much possibility do you think it has uh, to be actually materialized? And if so, how soon? Thank you. Well, yes. Do uh, you have an easier question? <laughs> uh, uh, a, a European finance minister uh, sounds good. Um, especially if you look at the sign above the door, I am the European Finance Minister, uh, it, would, it would say. Uh, the question, of course, the really interesting and important question is, what kind of finance minister are we talking about? Uh, is this person responsible for running and uh, uh, deciding on all 19 individual member states' budgets? 
Or is it a finance minister who is the boss of the other 19 finance ministers who chairs uh, the meetings of the Eurogroup and has a small budget uh, to run his or her uh, affairs? And then there are quite a number of intermediate uh, possibilities as well. So the question is maybe less, uh, is there a European finance minister, but is there a European budget? And many people would say, ah, but there is a European budget already. Uh, it is the EU budget for the 28. So the question is, should there be a budget for the euro area? And if the question is answered with yes, what should the budget be doing? And there have been uh, intellectually very satisfying papers and studies written <coughs> on this for the last uh, 20 or 30 years. And one of uh, the aspects uh, that, especially 20, 30 years ago, uh, was strongly focused on is, can you have a budget that is so large that it can provide, that it can help in anti-cyclical uh, financing? In the case of a downswing, can it provide additional impetus and stimulus to the economy and thereby contribute to the stabilization of uh, the euro area? Now, that is something uh, which very many member states, uh, I think, would not uh, uh, be in favor of. Another possibility is uh, have an additional budget uh, in order to finance, co-finance, I should say, investment. Uh, the question is, is this intended in order to uh, supplement conditions for fiscal rigor and fiscal stability or not? And then the question, of course, is how is such a budget financed? Is it financed simply by member states transfers or contributions, which is constitutionally not a great problem? Or is it financed uh, by a euro-wide taxing system which is constitutionally much more difficult. So much uh, of uh, what you were asking uh, would have a significant impact and needs to be analyzed from the point of view, how does it impact on my constitution, on the German constitution, the French constitution, the Dutch constitution. Does it, and presumably it does, would it have an impact on the constitutional powers of the national parliaments? And if it has an impact on the fiscal constitutional competence of the parliaments, then of course you have to give added legitimacy to it from somewhere else, from some other constitutionally elected body, be it the European Parliament or be it an assembly. So uh, if you just have the door with a nice sign above it, that's mm -hmm. fine. Mm -hmm. But as soon as you open the door, questions upon questions abound. So many people would probably prefer just to have the sign above the door and not open the door, because that is raising exactly these constitutional questions, political questions, financing questions, and what do you do with the money? Is it economically very meaningful or not? And maybe just in finalizing, we've got very serious discussions on what will happen to the EU budget once the UK withdraws from the European Union. And I can tell you, uh, is, this will be very, very difficult. It is starting to get very, very difficult. The EU budget is around 1% of GDP. And the Brits, when withdrawing, will leave a hole of around 10 billion euro. You might say this is peanuts for a whole continent. But the fight around these peanuts will be quite strenuous. So if we are talking, and we open the door where the finance minister's label is above it. If we open the door, how large is the budget? Is it another 1%, 2%, 5%? And depending on what you want to do, it may need to be sizable. And if we're already having such bitter debates about the peanuts of 10 billion, stay tuned. So uh, I think it can come in a context of an overall ambitious solution, 
but as a standalone item, <coughs> uh, I, uh, uh, I I don't think uh, I, I don't think as a standalone item that it, that it will occur. Okay. Anyone else? Somebody? Yes, uh, President Chair. <coughs> Um, it looks like that um, Greece uh, seems to have the financial problems. Uh, it's, uh, maybe it's on the verge of uh, almost bankruptcy. And that some other countries, um, not like that, but uh, say Italy and some other countries, uh, they do seem to have some financial risks. Uh, do you have any, say, control mechanism? as a EU to uh, monitor and say uh, control and manage this kind of financial problems of uh, individual countries well what what you are referring to uh, is of course the, the, the aftermath uh, of the financial crisis which turned into a sovereign debt crisis which then in 2012, uh, turned into a genuine uh, crisis of the euro. Um, and this crisis we saw uh, had been triggered uh, by the incompleteness of the architecture of, of the euro uh, with issues on exerting financial, fiscal, excuse me, fiscal uh, discipline, and coordination and cooperation with uh, issues on the supervision of, the joint supervision of uh, the financial sector, and the issue of diverging competitiveness between individual member states. And one of the uh, answers to this was the setting up uh, of the so-called European Stability Mechanism, which has a paid-in capital of 80 billion euro, which can give loans of up to 500 billion euro, and which has been uh, used in stabilizing, restructuring and stabilizing uh, uh, Euro area member states with such adjustment problems. Ireland, Portugal, Spain, Cyprus, and also Greece. And these programs with Ireland, Portugal, Spain, also Cyprus have been very successful. Um, Ireland, for example, is growing at a rate of 6-7%. Uh, they plan in the mid-20s to have reduced their government debt-to-GDP ratio from where it was at 130% down to under 40%. Uh, Spain has added 650,000 new jobs to their economy over the last 10 months, and so on. What is remaining is, uh, is Greece, uh, where today is Wednesday, this evening, in Brussels, I still have a meeting uh, on, on Greece to decide on the next disbursement uh, for, for Greece. And there, uh, one must say, uh, the process has been lengthy. Uh, the program will be over uh, in August 2018. Uh, Greece is preparing to uh, return to markets late this year, early 2018. Very much depends, of course, on the confidence that markets have in the policy, conduct of economic policy, not by the Europeans, but by the Greek government itself. Uh, is it predictable uh, what they are doing? Uh, is it pro-growth, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. And uh, as such, uh, we should also not forget uh, that there has been already over the past years, over the past, past five years, uh, debt relief uh, to the tune of uh, nearly 100% <coughs> of GDP already. And if necessary, further debt relief uh, will follow in mid-2018. So the maturity structure, the conditions of Greek debt, of Greek government debt, are the most favorable globally. Uh, any other state in the world, any other sovereign in the world, they would give their left hand for having such uh, financing conditions. Uh, with the average maturity of debt uh, around 30 years, uh, the average interest rate 
uh, on Greek government debt is around 1%. Uh, the gross financing needs are lower uh, than for many, many industrialized economies because uh, the maturity of debt stretches out already now uh, into the 2060s. So uh, there, what I uh, sometimes deplore is whatever one has done, uh, for example, for Greece, is consumed by the media and immediately forgotten. It's as if you had never done it. And one wants some more. It's a bit like Oliver Twist. Please, sir, may I have some more? <coughs> but that was <coughs> porridge. It was not debt relief. <laughs> so uh, yes, there will be more. Uh, and uh, as, a, as a rational investor, looking at the maturity structure of Greek debt, I would be buying Greek debt because they don't have any other redemptions, with a very few exceptions well into, uh, uh, very far into the next, uh, very far into the next decade. What is certain uh, is uh, that it is a combination of microeconomics, macroeconomics, financing conditions, but also institutional governance. Investors want certainty as how the administration is working. Investors want certainty on how the judicial system is working. And there, they make, of course, comparisons with, let's say, Germany or, or Holland. And many prefer to invest in Germany and not in Greece. But there are opportunities for investment in Greece. And I think there are upside uh, possibilities uh, uh, for the economy uh, of that country. But overall, you're right uh, in, in the sense there are imbalances. Uh, there are differences in productivity as there are these differences in productivity between Mississippi and Massachusetts. What happens uh, if you sit in low productivity Mississippi and are a gifted uh, person, you get onto the bus and you drive to Massachusetts and you're gone. Uh, in Europe, Europe is not as the Euro area is not such an optimal currency area as the US or Switzerland. Or, um, labor mobility is lower. And that is why one needs to bring not the people to the jobs, but one needs to bring the jobs to the people. And that is what I meant with the story of inclusive growth that stems partially uh, to a very large part from what national governments need to do to make the economy more productive. And I like to think of the European Union and the Euro area institutions uh, as a roof over a house. Uh, if you don't have the walls and the fundamental uh, structure, which is national, good, solid national policies, you don't even need a roof because the roof disappears without, without these walls. On the other hand, it is a roof. If you just have the walls, which is sound national policies, but not the roof of the EU policy framework above it, as soon as it starts raining, you get wet uh, and, and the whole structure crumbles. So it is the interplay between the national and the, and the EU level uh, which, which will lead to that. Given that, uh, without mention, you mentioned a country that is, of course, uh, an issue of, uh, uh, I would say, being more in public, uh, needs to be watched. Okay. <clears throat> any any other questions, comments? Okay, over there. Thank you, Chairman Visa. My question is about your prospect about the uh, G20 meeting soon to be held in Germany. The Korean President Moon is leaving for Germany soon, and. Uh, Donald Trump is going to meet Theresa May, Emmanuel Macron, as well as uh, Angela Merkel again without Helsinki. So, what's your prospect of the uh, G20 meeting in Germany? It's a very good question, but maybe uh, to, to other people uh, who are sitting right now in Hamburg as Sherpa and uh, drafting, were drafting uh, uh, conclusions. Uh, so, 
I think all I, w all I would say at this stage is uh, it's much about the same questions which I tried to address uh, in, in my talk. Can one uh, be persuaded as a G20, which is of course there are 30 countries participating, can one be persuaded as a G20 that multilateral solutions for global problems are better than national solutions for global problems or no solutions for global problems. And that goes for all of these issues that range from climate change. How do you combat climate change uh, if you're doing it? Only Korea, all by itself, might as well not do it. Uh, how do you manage to make sure that what Korea is doing is good for the economy and the environment and not good for the environment only? That you can only ensure through international cooperation and agreements. So how does one deal with that? How does one uh, address possible concerns in the international trading system by going through those institutions and processes that the WTO and other institutions provide for it. And you don't unilaterally shoot something from the hip. Can everybody be persuaded to go through this route? Or are there some uh, who believe uh, that they are in a position of perceived or subjective strength and therefore go towards unilateral institution, uh, uh, solutions? So that is how I perceive the big, big question of Hamburg to be. Do we believe and do we trust uh, in a truly multilateral system? And I sincerely hope we're all representatives of countries that are not very small, uh, but not the largest, uh, where uh, security concerns are coupled with economic interests and economic concerns. So. We rely on these things much, much more than a very, very large uh, uh, country would do. Uh, and so for us, all of this, Hamburg is for us much, much more important than very many G20 summits uh, that we've had over the last, let's say, five years uh, or so. Six, seven, eight, nine years back, the G20 was instrumental in helping us avoid a meltdown of the global economy. And that was good. The G20 <coughs> was the instrument of <coughs> choice in doing that. But that was a financial crash. And what we need to <coughs> do now is avoid an institutional <coughs> crash. Avoiding institutional crashes is of the essence. And that's, that's how I would perceive the, the big message. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. A start of question, I just wanted to yeah. hear a simple message from a colleague at the WTO about um, the, the, about the uh, lack of leadership. Uh, the colleague said uh, the WTO is really going adrift because, of, because there's no leadership now um, due to that specific country. Uh, 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 and my colleague said, a bad leader is better than no leader. <laughs> yes, uh, yes. Some people will say a bad decision is better than no decision. Mm -hmm. uh, but sometimes if the decisions get really bad, I start wondering uh, how that is. But in all fairness, we must say, we have to take ourselves by our ears. Is the WTO drifting around, and our multi is the multilateral trading system, drifting around the picture only since the elections in the United States in 2016? Of course not. Of course not. And you can say the elections in, 19, in 2016, not only in the US but in other countries, they were symbols and symptoms of things that had started much, much earlier. And the WTO has been uh, not as effective uh, over the last decade. Uh, we have entered uh, in international trade agreements, of course, in areas that impinge much more on the perception of national autonomy 
than the simple trade liberalization of successive GATT rounds from the 50s onwards uh, uh, did. And if you look again at, at the protests against proposed free trade agreements or trade, trade agreements, uh, which we have in the United States, very much is about uh, judicial and quasi-judicial uh, 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 issues. It is very much about what is the impact on national standards. Trade liberalization as we did it when, when we were kids, tariff reduction and so on. That's, 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 not, that's not the problem. Uh, the population is uh, uh, up in arms uh, against these issues. So uh, let's, let's not forget we were, uh, we were already globally not sticking uh, to uh, uh, the primacy of multilateral solutions uh, long before anybody uh, could spell Brexit or, or, or other things. And the perceived inefficiency of uh, the global uh, system does not begin and end with the WTO. The whole United Nations system uh, has become unwieldy and uh, could be more equitable and more efficient, better run, uh, leaner but meaner, as they, uh, as, as they would say. But it's always the member states who let it be as it is. Uh. Okay. <coughs> Any other <coughs> questions? Yes, of the very much. Thank you for paying a visit here in Korea, Mr. Weiser. And I have uh, one question is, uh, as you mentioned, uh, there are signs of confidence in the market and uh, there are signs of tapering as well. So uh, one of it could be uh, last week's uh, in the Mario Draghi's remark or speech in the ECB forum that uh, the but some says uh, this is a sign of tapering, but some others says it, this, the market is misjudging. But, so I want to hear your take. Uh, what do you think of it? Uh, what's your opinion on his speech? And uh, if that, if the tapering is actually drawing here, what the, what should emerging market uh, brace for to and, and prepare for the the move? Uh, we've, we've got a very good uh, separation uh, of competences uh, in, in Europe, as in many other areas, uh, between monetary policy and other policy areas. So uh, I, I would not comment publicly uh, on uh, what Mario Draghi may have meant or may not have meant. Um, what I would say, however, is that uh, this situation where uh, changes in the monetary policy stance of major central banks are underway or may be underway in uh, the near future require more than ever uh, deep international uh, cooperation and I would not say coordination but cooperation uh, in order uh, for these changes in the monetary policy stance uh, to be productive and not uh, disruptive. And uh, we know for a fact, of course, that the major, uh, major central banks uh, are in continuous contact uh, with each other. There is also the implication that as monetary policy uh, were to normalize, one has to think of it also in interaction with other policy areas, such as fiscal uh, policies. So. Uh, there is a, as far as fiscal policies are concerned, there is a degree of, uh, there is a degree of uh, challenge uh, also for uh, finance ministers in order uh, to make the uh, overall policy stance um, uh, more uh, conducive uh, to uh, growth near potential at 
uh, with inflation rates uh, which meet uh, but do not exceed uh, the inflation targets of central <coughs> banks. So I have a strong preference of not talking in public about monetary policy, <laughs> uh, which I have not done <coughs> with my answer. Okay. If I may, I, I think there is possibility of um, <coughs> another tapered tantrum, uh, not as, as serious as we had uh, uh, that with the U.S. Fed's uh, first uh, indication of uh, undoing unconventional monetary policy. Now, ECB is indicating, <coughs> I suppose, is legitimately uh, in a position to think about it and to rewinding the uh, unconventional monetary policies. And also, sooner or later, Japanese, Japan, central banks will have to do the same thing. That is the reason, ideally, if I were the one of the G20 leaders, I would put much priority on international financial cooperation and coordination, uh, given this uh, global financial situation. Uh, particularly, there are so many emerging economies which are very, very vulnerable to uh, very rapid and volatile capital uh, the, uh, movements. Uh, and uh, those problems are not really for their, the uh, uh, emerging economies problems alone because emerging economies as a whole is very, very important and therefore spillover effect from the emerging world to advanced economies can be substantial. Sub substantial. Mm -hmm. That is the reason why G20 leaders should pay more attention to this. <coughs> Unfortunately, uh, this is not, I don't think, on top of the G20's priority this time. For that matter, actually, I would hope our President Moon will play a role there to exert global leadership, bring this uh, uh, to the uh, leaders' uh, attention. G20's problem is the the no country now uh, takes leadership. I mean ownership of exerting leadership, because G7 have the already G7 and G2 can talk themselves uh, um, between uh, themselves. And so, uh, country like Korea and uh, other countries uh, should work together and. Because the world is now, is uh, journalistically say, G zero world or <laughs> no polar world. So we do need the collective leadership, and the collective leadership forum, G20 can be the forum for collective leadership. But unfortunately, it's not working. So it's now that's my uh, comments on G20. Let me ask you this. As a casual observer, as you know, as a European, you're not really just a casual observer. But I mean, how Europeans see Korean Peninsula problem, uh, the issue uh, from European perspective. How you see the how the, the ordinary European see would see the Korean Peninsula problem, the issue. We've got until midnight, I guess. <laughs> uh, I think what's, uh, what's very much in, in, in the media is, of course, the security, uh, missile-related, uh, human rights-related uh, part of the story. And that is something which, maybe not on a daily basis, but nearly daily basis, uh, uh, is, is uh, served to the European population uh, through the media. So. Uh, I think that is also a reason why I would think that the institutions of the European Union and of several member states uh, would be wishing to engage more deeply uh, in, in, in this dialogue. 
um, or solution, participate or contribute to the solution of the problem. Um, at the same time, we have to be cognizant of the fact uh, that Europe as a whole and individual European uh, member states uh, do not participate in, let's say, global security architecture. Uh, many of them participate in NATO uh, and related activities, uh, but not, of course, there is only one uh, global uh, uh, military power. And as such, it is maybe less on the uh, agenda in the, in, in the sense that it directly impacts on the individual European politician and the individual European citizen to the extent that because of the direct security involvement of the U.S., it would impact on the U.S. citizen. So uh, then you have a bit of a disconnect, and then you have, uh, I think, the perception of Korea as such a huge, uh, uh, huge economy, with a huge trading nation, which uh, provides for numerous jobs in Europe uh, through uh, direct investment, for example, in the automotive sector, but not only in the automotive sector. And the peculiar thing is, uh, I think that this, this perception uh, are two different perceptions, as if you're not talking about the same economy. For the man and the woman on the street, mm -hmm. they see Korea, the trading giant, disconnect, and then there's the security concern about the peninsula. Uh, so what... Uh, I would hope for is that over the coming months and years uh, there is more of a also popular perception that we share an interest in solving through multilateral institutions global issues. Um, but we're not there yet. Mm -hmm. Yesterday, Financial Times said uh, uh, the uh, uh, report about uh, Chancellor Merkel's uh, criticism on the uh, uh, U.S. President's uh, climate change policy and the trade policy, uh, which is not the first time. But do you see uh, there will be some compromise or there will be continued uh, dispute between Europe, uh, led by uh, Chancellor Merkel and the and the uh, uh, Donald Trump on the other side. Side. You see any compromise, or you see continued uh, dispute at the conference? There are differences between what one hopes for uh, and what is a realistic uh, mm -hmm. projection. Um, I've also. Uh, seen some reports uh, that there are hopes of rejuvenating uh, the uh, trade agreement, uh, but I'm not so sure about that. Mm. So uh, if, if you look at the overall trading relationship between the United States and, and, and Europe, uh, I see very little uh, I see very little reason to believe, that any part of that trade uh, is uh, done through unfair trading practices. Uh, this is maybe in stark contrast to what was the case for 30, 40 years ago, uh, when subsidies to the most different sectors abounded, quantitative restrictions uh, were the uh, uh, rule of the day. And these days have disappeared. Um, and. Of course, there are uh, uh, there are issues on both sides. Uh, buying American, there are uh, issues around uh, uh, government uh, support for wide-bodied aircraft of an indirect nature. But there are fora for solving these uh, these issues, and they have been solved over the decades, one way or the other, usually through multilateral disputes mechanisms. So uh, I would strongly, I would simply say uh, I think there are less than ever material reasons for such conflicts. 
uh, we also note, uh, for example, uh, what uh, the latest uh, uh, text on currency manipulation was, which I think was a fair judgment uh, of, of the situation, namely uh, that, that there is none. I think incidentally that uh, the, the role of the Chinese authorities towards their exchange rate uh, has been fairly, fairly uh, depicted uh, by, by uh, the official analysis uh, of, of, of the U.S. authorities. And so if anything were to escalate on the trade front, uh, this would be unfortunate, uh, not grounded uh, in reality uh, or facts, and therefore we, we hope. Okay, uh, with this we have to uh, <coughs> let uh, Mr. Visser go to work. <laughs> Everybody has to go to work. Uh, it's almost nine o'clock now, so we have to end here. Uh, we appreciate very much for sharing your very insightful and illuminating views on uh, European <coughs> issues and the global issues and implications for the rest of the world. I just hope you have a good stay here and productive uh, meetings and uh, have uh, another opportunity to visit us again. Thank Many you thanks. very much. Thank you. Many thanks. Okay. Okay.